Hi, in this series we're looking at the wonderful world of compute shaders. In this episode we're going to implement edge detection using several simple shaders using convolution filters. We're going to use Unity's video player component to output a video to a render texture and apply the shaders to this to get an outline added to our video. Let's get started. Adding a video into a Unity scene is very straightforward as they helpfully provide us with the video player component that does all the hard work. You can get access to this using the Unity engine.video namespace. In our example, we're going to add this lovely video of St Paul's Cathedral in London, which I got from the Adobe Stock video collection. We're going to structure the code so that you can drop the script onto an empty game object and it'll create everything you need for you. For this, we'll need to provide three variables to begin with. The compute shader to use, the video clip to play, and the size of the quads you want to generate. For this demonstration, we're going to create output for each stage of the edge detection algorithm, so you can see what it's doing. As such, we're going to need seven quads along with their associated materials and render textures. We're using render textures as we can pass these to our compute shaders to update the image. So let's initialize these in the awake function. We create our three arrays and iterate over them, initializing each element. The render textures, we want to create them to match the dimensions of our input video clip. We are using the ARGB float format for the texture representation, because as we'll see later, we're going to be wanting to use positive and negative values when processing the image. It's critical that we enable random write on the render texture so that the compute shader can operate on it. The materials we're using for the quads are the standard unlit textures for simplicity. If you were using the video player to represent, say, a TV or a camera video feed in your game, you might want to use something more appropriate. For the quads, we assigned our materials, which are linked to those processing render textures which we'll have our output on. In this case, we're going to set them all to the same size, position them one below each other, so we can scroll through them in our scene and see the differences. With that little bit of setup out of the way, we can now add the video player onto our first quad, like so. The important bit to note here is that we're outputting the video to a render texture, which in this case we've set to the processing texture zero. This means the raw video is visible on our first quad. Great, now we can get started with adding the edge detection. We're going to do this using image convolutions. As ever, you can make things seem stupidly difficult by turning it into maths. I give you the general convolution expression. That is, g of x, y is going to be the sum over dx, dy of w dx, dy times f of x plus dx, y plus dy. What that's saying is that our output pixel value gy is the weighted sum of the weights, the w dx, dy bit, of the neighbouring pixels and of the original image pixel f of x, y. We're just talking about pixels of images, so let's do this in a natural visual representation, which is far more intuitive. The size of the convolution can be whatever you like. Here, we'll just be using the 3x3 convolutions. The bigger they are, the more work you have to do per pixel, so there is always a trade-off to be had. The process is to take this and apply it to each pixel in turn, creating a new image. The eagle-eyed among you will note that when dealing with the edges of an image, you need to reference pixels that aren't there. There are a few methods to deal with this. You can repeat the texture, effectively wrapping around it. You can clamp the value to the last pixel that you saw. You can mirror it, so you flip the image. Unity provides all these options in the texture.wrap mode property. So you're able to choose whichever one fits best for what your application is. Let's consider the most simple. The identity. Here we set the target pixel value, the center one, to just itself. Not very exciting that one. If instead we have this one, this is going to take the original pixel value, add all of its eight neighbors to it, and then normalize it by dividing by nine. Here we've essentially averaged the pixel value, so you end up with a box blur. Other examples might include a Gaussian blur, which puts more weight on the center in the horizontal and vertical pixels, and say sharpen. But enough about that. We're all here for edge detection. To detect edges, we only care about the intensity of the image, so we'll be dealing with a grayscale image. We'll come back to how to convert our image to grayscale later. For the edge detection, we're going to use the Sobel filter. This is a two-pass filter, which means we're going to process the image once to detect the horizontal edges, 
a second time to detect the vertical edges and then combine them together. Let's look at how this works in practice on this very simple example image. Starting with the vertical filter, you can see that we have a negative edge to the left, zero in the middle, and a positive edge to the right. Extra weighting being put on the pixels immediately to the left and the right of the target. So when this passes over a vertical line, you get something either looking very positive or very negative, depending on whether you've gone from sort of a white to a black or a black to a white. Where you have constant intensity or it's very slowly varying, it will be close to zero. The horizontal edge detector is the same principle with a rotated filter. And this is what each of them looks like on a more interesting image. So let's dive in and get some shader code written to get us to this step before we go any further. For each compute shader you're going to include in your file, you need to have a hash pragma line that tells the compiler the name of the function. These are traditionally referred to as kernels in GPU programming. We've defined one each for the three functions we're going to create now. For passing in the textures, there's two different kinds we're going to be using. You can use the texture 2D for those which you're just reading from, and we're going to use the read-write texture 2D for those which we need to write to also, as we do in this case. Let's start off with our grayscale function. Before any kernel, we specify the number of threads it's going to use. Depending on your problem, you may wish to partition it into one, two, or three dimensions. In this case, we're operating on 2D images, so it's natural to give the kernel an 8x8 square of pixels to operate on at a time. Unfortunately, there isn't any one-size-fits-all set of parameters that will be optimal for every algorithm. This all depends on the memory access, number of variables, and not to mention the model of GPU you're running it on. So if you're going to get serious with compute shaders and wish to get the optimal performance, I recommend looking at introductory courses for CUDA or OpenCL, and they'll cover this in great detail. The arguments take a uint3 called id with the type sv dispatch thread id. What this does is populate the id value with the current slice of the problem you're doing. If you think about this in 3D, it's the coordinates xyz of the pixels you're operating on. This is calculated based on the number of threads of your kernel and how many times you dispatch the kernel, so that it covers the whole space of the image. Now the grayscale function itself is fairly simple, but it has a few important concepts in there if you've not used shaders before. To convert our image to grayscale, it is as simple as taking the average of the red, green and blue channels. For each pixel, we get the xy coordinate as a float 2 by extracting just the xy parameter from the ID. Then we can access the individual colours in the texture using the R, G and B properties of that. We're then going to set the value of our grayscale image to this and retain the existing alpha value because we don't want to change that. Our video now looks like this. Sorry, I didn't exactly choose the most colourful image to start with. Now let's go on to our Sobel filters before going back and seeing how to actually launch the kernel code. Again, we specify the threads so we're operating on an 8x8 grid of pixels. We create a new pixel that starts at zero, and then we're going to add or subtract the relevant values for those pixels around as specified in the filter, which we put in a comment there to remind us. We're going to retain the alpha component and apply the result to the output texture. The vertical code is exactly the same idea, just with a different filter put in. Here's what the results look like side by side. The one on the left is doing a really good job at finding the horizontal lines, and the one on the right, the vertical ones. As we are working with floating points in our shader, when they are rendered, we only see the values between 0 and 1, as all the edges represented by negative numbers are being mapped to black. We can add a normalization fudge to this so it displays as we expect. So, how do we actually call these kernels? The first thing we need to do is tell them what textures they're operating on. Here, you use the set texture method. This takes an integer that defines the kernel. This is a zero up index as found by the order of your hash pragma statements. Then a string that identifies the variable name, followed by the text you want to assign it to. We can add a few extra lines to the start of the await function to cache these indices, like this using the find kernel method. This means we don't have to worry that our code will break if we modify the order of our compute shaders or add any more in. In the update method, we're going to call these kernels. This is done with the dispatch method. Again, this takes the ID of the kernel you want to run, then you tell it how many times you want to run the kernel in each of the three dimensions. 
In our case, our kernels are all two-dimensional, operating on an 8x8 bit of pixels, so we need to submit thread groups x as the width of the texture divided by 8 to be covered the whole space, similarly for y. Thread group z is set to 1, as we're not splitting the computation over that dimension. Great, so we've gone from the original video to the grayscale, then to the horizontal and vertical save our filters. Now we want to combine these into a single one, like this. To do this, we need to remember that in our Sobel filter output, we have values taking negative and positive values to find the edges, and zero for the uninteresting regions. For edge detection, we don't care about the direction, just the magnitude of the edginess. That's a real word, I promise. This can be calculated as the sum of the square of each of the input pixel values, and then we take the square root. You will find that in GPU programming, often you can get away without using the square root step and just have larger values to deal with. The next step is to threshold the result. We only want to keep the strongest edges. There are a variety of ways you could do this depending on how you wanted to use your edge texture. Here we've chosen to use the step function. This takes two values, in this case our threshold and the pixel values. It sets the alpha to zero if the second is less than the first and one if it is larger. This means our edge texture has hard pixel values of either zero or one. If you want to retain the intensity of the edges above your threshold, we can multiply this by the edge value. Here you can see the effect of modifying the threshold value and the soft versus hard thresholding. Finally, we want to modify the colour of our outline and overlay it onto our original image. Now I'm sure there's a method to do this in Unity, but we're going shader crazy and we'll just write our own. So here we'll use the ternary operator. This is going to set the pixels to the coloured outline if they're not black. Otherwise, we're going to use the original pixel values. Again, now we have the final product, we can again modify the thresholding and colour until we find something we like. This is just touching the surface of what you can do with edge detection. There's lots more theories out there to get even better results. As ever, the full code is linked in the description below, and I hope you found this information useful in some way. See you next time.